Acadia Divinity College, the Graduate School of Theology at Acadia University. I first met Dr. Holmes by telephone and by email as we tried to work with another arrangement. And I must confess that his personal presence is much more lively than his topic. <laughs> I know it's somewhat redundant, but I will formally introduce him again. Peter is married to Janet, and they have three children. He is a senior minister of York Minister Park Baptist Church in Toronto. And as a preacher, as a minister, Peter seeks to combine the warmth and wisdom of pastor's heart with the passion and imagination of a storyteller. Peter completed his doctoral studies in 2006 at Acadia Divinity College and Acadia University here in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. His thesis work, which forms the subject of his uh, lectures to us these past evenings, is in the area of preaching at funerals. He completed this work under the supervision of Reverend Dr. Paul Scott Wilson from Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. Along the way, Peter was also mentored by York Ministers, York Minister Park's late Minister Emeritus, the Reverend Dr. John N. Gladstone. Prior to coming to York Minister Park in 1995, Peter served as the minister of the First Baptist Church in Montreal, a historic urban church with a multi-ethnic congregation. In 1983, he entered seminary at Wycliffe College, at seminary, a seminary at the University of Toronto. While there, he was mentored by the renowned preacher, Dr. A. Leonard Griffith, and the Reverend William Leach, a former chaplain of the Toronto General Hospital. Peter also served as a student of the late Richard Coffin at Blythewood Baptist Church in Toronto, where he was, first, where he was later ordained in 1987. He also serves on many committees of both denominational and ecumenical nature. I thought I'd add this to my introduction of him because it was what inspired me as I look back in my own undergraduate work. It's by John Donne. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep wish but thy pictures be much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow. And soon as our best men with thee do go rest their bones and souls delivery, thou art a slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. And dost poison with war, sickness, dost thou poison war and sickness dwell and poppy, or charms can make us sleep as well. And better than thy stroke, why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. I want to call Dr. Holmes to pray with you as you present your final lecture with us this evening, preaching life to death. Father, we thank you that your servant has been teaching us to choose life, even in the face of death. We thank you for his pilgrimage, for his passion, for his pastoral warmth. And we thank you for the power through which you have used him in these times as we engage in this final lecture this evening, we pray that it might be a formative experience for all of us, and together we will leave renewed, encouraged, and empowered to do as he said to us, preach life unto death. And may many be encouraged, comforted, and renewed. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you all. Thank you. 
the, for those who weren't with us the first two evenings, I'll just very quickly um, go over a f- uh, the things that I spoke about. Uh, um, the first evening we spoke about waking up to the obituaries and, and the realities that we face in this age that are so different than the realities faced in previous generations. Um, and it began with, with the whole notion that people want the service to be very personal, whereas in the 19th century you can go out through sermon after sermon after sermon at funerals without finding the mention of the name of the deceased. And now people take great offense when the name's not there. They want the, the family, the, the, uh, the, the story to be told. Um, and, th- and then we spoke about the, um, the move in this time from cremation and then memorial and the delay that sometimes that brings, and then the mood for celebration, and we addressed us that last night, and celebration has a place, um, as we said last night, but the problem with it is that if it's just celebration alone, so often it ends up um, being the denial of, of death, and it's a very hollow celebration. Um, and so we talked about that last night. We, ta- we talked about the need to, to address death um, and give people permission to grieve, and then move them to the celebration of the resurrection. Um, and then we talked about some, some other changes, and one of them in particular um, I want to address tonight. Um, one of them was the, the loss of home, what I call home field advantage. So often now the service isn't in the church, and it's in the funeral home or somewhere else, where we can have some kind of influence, but we can't set the rules as we can in the church. And so all kinds of other things are introduced, and and we have less and less control over those things. Eulogies, for example, which have a place. Um, And and then we talked about the, um, with that, the the loss of the scriptures, because we're living in an age of biblical illiteracy. And sometimes I'll, I'll always say that this is what I do and I'm a minister of the church, and this is what I do wherever I go. And part of what I do is to read the scriptures. And that's, in my view, essential. I don't think I've ever conducted a service without reading the scriptures. Um, I I will give families the opportunity to participate in the selection of texts. More often than not, they'll say, they'll leave it to me. But when it comes to the preaching event, the congregation that's at a funeral is not the same congregation that's with us on Sunday morning. The congregation with us on Sunday morning is, is gathered beneath the word to hear the word proclaimed. The congregation that's, that's gathered at a funeral is gathered to support the bereaved and to honor the deceased by their presence And so they really look to the story of the deceased as, I would say that for many of the people gathered, the story of the deceased has more authority at the service than the scriptures. Not not in the big picture, not in the eternal dimension. I think there's something, well, there's something very remarkable about the scriptures, we know that. So that you can read the scriptures, and they are a two-edged sword, and sometimes they cut right to the heart of things. The scriptures speak like no other word. And so I don't want to diminish the place of scripture, but what I want to say is address this problem that in this reality that when we are gathered at a funeral, the people don't look to the scriptures, they don't give the scriptures any authority, and many of the people will, as I said that night, look upon the scriptures, not only with their own biblical illiteracy, but they'll look on the scriptures as being a book that's outdated and irrelevant. They say it from their ignorance, but they think it. And there's enough other people saying it in various ways that that's what they think. And so that's what I want to address tonight. What do we do? How do we proclaim the word, the good news, in an age where so many who are gathered at a funeral have no regard for the scriptures. Now, before I, I get into this evening's address, I wanted to acknowledge uh, and, and give you thanks for this opportunity to have been with you um, this week. It's been very meaningful for me. I've appreciated the interchange, the questions, the opportunities to, to interact with you. 
I've been moved by the stories that I've heard from you and, and touched and, and uh, encouraged and affirmed in many ways. I want to thank Harry, uh, Dr. Gardner. Uh, what a wonderful choice he has been for your new uh, principal or president. He, he, um, I've just gotten to know him this week. And, well, God bless you, Harry, but I, I know these are going to be exciting days and years ahead for Acadia Divinity College, and, and I rejoice. My heart um, is warmed by his leadership and his presence and the vision that he's been developing and unfolding before you. And I want to say bless you. Um, I, I'm so delighted for all of you and for us as a denomination nationally as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been so generous um, with their time and those who have entertained us and shown us their hospitality beginning on Sunday with my dear friend Barry, with whom I've been reunited from Wolfville Baptist, uh, going back to our years together in Montreal. So thank you. Uh, it's been a great privilege to be with you. As Lionel said, um, I, do, I am married and I have three children. And one of my, my wife was with me part of the time. She went home yesterday. Our son, who's in high school, she's... That's the main reason she went home, but she also was working. But um, one of my daughters has been with us, and that's been very special. And uh, so uh, last night she was at the lecture. I don't think she's here now, but, but uh, she's been going around the university, and she's on reading week from university herself. And my other daughter, the oldest one, who's at the University of Western Ontario in her last year, she's been phoning me every night to say, how's it going, Dad? That's the way she is. So it's a great encouragement. And um, thank you, Lionel, for for mentioning them. So, a word of thanks. And now, I want to get into this matter of preaching life to death. And what I mean by that, of course, when I was talking to my father and he asked me for my titles, and I said preaching life to death, and he, he thought I meant the preaching to death with the preaching life. And, uh, of course, what I'm getting at in the context is, is that we are here to preach eternal life in the face of death. Death, where is thy sting, grave, where is thy victory? That's our call, to preach that message, to be like Ezekiel, to preach to the dry bones the good news that God can raise them up and give new life. And that's our call. So how do we do that in an age when the people who are gathered at a funeral have little regard for the scriptures, and yet it's what we want to get them to, the good news of, of Christ's resurrection, of his victory over the grave. Well, we could, we could enter the pulpit um, with just a good old-fashioned exegetical sermon, which is what they did in the 19th century with those sermons that were an hour, an hour and a half long. They were exegetical sermons. They'd start with the scripture, and they'd oftentimes just work through a text or have just one quotation after another, and always the theme was, was biblical, and they didn't get far beyond the scriptures. We could do that. And I've had people come as guests to conduct services to, to be the homilist or the, or the preacher at a funeral in my church, and I, I had one, and I remember him taking a text and preaching an exegetical sermon as he would on a Sunday, and it would have been a good Sunday sermon, but my sense was that no one was there with him. That he, that he was preaching to the air. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but I just wonder about how effective it is to just simply abstractly talk about death and talk about resurrection without really getting into the nuts and bolts of the situation with which we're dealing and so the alternative, of course, is to do what we seem to be called to do in this age, or what there's a longing for, and that is a personalization of the funeral homily or sermon. And there's various ways that, that we can see that it's being done, and people are attempting to do it. And I've collected all kinds of sermons uh, from funerals, and, and I've been able to say, okay, there's a pattern here, there's something here. And, and there is a definite pattern in preaching at funerals with people trying to take something in the life of the deceased and, and bring it into a particular scripture. That seems to be one of the primary patterns. 
Um, one of the best places to find this is in a book which some of you may or may not know about. I'm sent one for some reason every year in the mail. I've never bought one. Um, and the only things I've read in it are the funeral sermons. But it's called the Minister's Manual. Has anyone seen that? I shouldn't tell you about it because it'll give you a different sermon for every Sunday of the year. And it's not a good idea if everyone's preaching the same sermon. It's, it's what we need to do, of course, is, is find, uh, you go through the Word, that great exercise of studying the Word Sunday by Sunday and listening for the Spirit and, and proclaiming the Word to our people. So, but there, there's lots of seeds in the book, and you, some of you may find it very, very helpful. But there's a pattern. As I've looked through that book uh, across a number of years, there is this pattern of, of people going to the story, finding something in the story that relates to a specific text, and then having related it, preaching on the text. Now, it goes back earlier than, than my connection or my readings in that book. I can remember when I first started in ministry, um, one of the ministers I worked with used this exact technique, and I can remember very vividly some of the sermons he preached at funerals for people in the church. One of them was a wonderful woman, and he preached a sermon on the parable of the talents. And he said she was a five-talent woman. And he named all of her talents, and then he, he named ways in which those talents had been blessed and had become ten. And I don't have the text for that sermon, so I can't comment on it, except to say that I remember it very distinctly, so it must have been very good. Um, and I remember who it related to, and I remember some of the things that he said. I remember another sermon that he gave, though again, I don't have the text, and it was on a minister who had retired and was in the congregation, and he died, and he said, Behold, a man in whom there is no guile. He found this something in the person's life, he found a text that fit, and then he preached on the text. And it's more effective, you know, as he, as he worked with the five talents of the woman, he could speak specifically about her life. And so it was a very personal sermon. Um, and there was a, there's a biblical pattern there. So he's finding something, and he's bringing the people to the Scripture. And in a sense, he's telling the people, and this pattern tells the people, that the Scriptures are relevant. Listen how they speak to the life. Listen how they speak to our lives. And so that's good, and I applaud that. Um, of course, there, there's some things we need to be cautious about. We can run low on characters. And all the characters in the Bible aren't necessarily good. or it's, you know, A lot of them have their dark sides, as we all do. Um, so we, we need to be somewhat careful. With that. I mean, you can't preach ten sermons in your church on the five-talent steward. Um, you can't keep going back to that well. So, so that's one limiting factor with that. But I've used it myself, and, and I believe it can be very effective. I used it once. We had a, a group in our church. Um, well, uh, let me go back a, ste a step. There was a, a woman in the neighborhood whose mother, whose father had died in England. And her mother was there, and she, her life was falling into meaningless. And this daughter who lived in the neighborhood of the church brought her mother over from England. She had no one left there. She was all alone. She brought her over. And then one day she brought her across the street to the church and she introduced her to a group in the church which did a lot of uh, knitting and this kind of thing for the poor and they were called the Dorcas group. And this woman had a wonderful life with these women and a wonderful life with her daughter who cared for her profoundly. And this was one of those cases where in fact I was able to be with the daughter and her husband and the woman when the woman died. It was a very moving um, it was a very moving time. The woman had 10 years in Canada when it seemed that her life was over. And so at her funeral, I spoke about, I asked the question, what did they say at Dorcas' funeral? You see, she was a member of the Dorcas group. She did a lot of the things that Dorcas did. And like Dorcas, she'd been given a second lease on life when she was brought over. And so I said, you know, they gave thanks for the new life in Jesus Christ that this woman had been given. And that's what we thank God for. But they also gave thanks for the promise of eternal life, which she had tasted in the resurrection. Now, I preached that sermon, and I, 
I think it was effective, but I can't, unfortunately, preach that sermon for every woman in our Dorcas group. It won't, you know, it'll lose its effect. There, there was, in, in the minister's manual, I found a sermon, a funeral sermon, preached about somebody whose name was Frank. The preacher didn't know him, but he went, as, as I think we should, and met with the family. He discovered that Frank was, he didn't say a whole lot about, what, about Frank, but he, he liked to eat a lot. He, um, he, he owned a gun shop, and he was a hunter. Now, he took that and he said, aha, uh-huh. and he went to the scriptures and he found just the person to talk about. Can you think? Esau. And so he took this story and he said, he's just like Esau. <laughs> and I, I don't know if he was a hairy man or what. But he, he then went on to speak about the story of Esau and said little more about the deceased. You don't find out much about the person's story except that he liked his food, he, he owned a gun shop, and he was a hunter. And that's about all you learn. And then you get into the story of Esau, and you're not sure if it's anything like this man's story or not. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that maybe everyone out there... The funny thing is that he began the sermon by saying, when he said, just like Esau, he said, now I told a friend of mine who knows that this is what I do, said, which affirmed that this is the method, said, what are, you know, what are you going to do? And he said, I, I'm going to talk about Esau. And my friend said, how on earth are you going to talk about Esau? What does that have to do with grief and mourning and resurrection? He acknowledged that question, and then he went on for about three or four paragraphs in the sermon to justify why he picked Esau without really ever talking about the man, the the deceased, that is. And they got into the story of Esau. Now, the story of Esau does have a wonderful ending. I mean, part of it does. You know, the reunion with Jacob. You know, where Jacob has to cross the river, and it's nighttime, and he's afraid. He's afraid because of everything that he's done and how he's fooled and tricked his brother. He's afraid, so he's sending all those gifts. You remember trying to, trying to earn his way back into his brother's good books? And his brother will have nothing of it. And Esau comes and throws his arms around Jacob. Now, there's, there's something beautiful. You can make a great deal out of that. If there was any kind of connection with the person's story, and Jacob has that beautiful thing he says, doesn't he say something like, when I looked upon your face, I could see the face of God? Or, you know, there was something very profound in that story. But he didn't really get to that, unfortunately. He did make allusions to the resurrection, but, but I just came away. With, and in fact, at one point, he even said in the sermon, he said, all of a sudden acknowledging that maybe, you know, there might be some animal rights people in the congregation. And, and he said something, of course, of course. I'm sure that he dealt humanely with the animals that he killed. (laughs) And and gone. It was gone. It doesn't always work. You have to really work at it to make it work. There's there's possibilities. Even in the Esau story, there's a possibility with that thing with Jacob. And and maybe you could come to something about the reunion with God, the God who who despite whatever we've been up to, that's more relating us to Jacob than to Esau. And my goodness, even if you pulled it off, what would happen if someone went home and, and opened up their Bible to look for Esau and happened upon Malachi 1 or Romans 9? You know what it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. There's all of that too. We have to be very, very careful with, with that message. But, but it can work. It can work effectively to listen to someone's story and then take them to the scripture. There, there was another one called a, a biblical virtue. And this was quite good. It was in the minister's manual in 2003. I don't think that's what it's called. That's what I've called it, I should say. And, and the person, it, it was someone who had died in their own congregation. So they knew this woman well. She was an elderly woman who had passed away. And he went to Psalm 112. 
where it speaks about the righteous person and three characteristics of the righteous person. One who deals generously and conducts their affairs with justice. Number one. And so then he spoke about how this person was generous and just. Number two, one who rises in the darkness. And so he spoke about how she literally took her work from the church home and would work late into the night and then be up early to be at more things at the church the next day or whatever her responsibilities were. And then number three, heart is steady and not afraid. And he talked about her courage in life and in death. But in the end, in the end, though it was very good and well written, it was little more than a morality lesson. It was little more than say she was good, she was generous, she was, she, she was hardworking, she was devout, she was this, she was that. And there was little recognition of grief or opportunity for grief. And there was even less proclamation of the good news. The good news was simply that she was good enough. Now, I think you could take that text and, and just work with a little bit. And so when it says rises in the darkness, you can talk about all of her, her hard work at night and her getting up early in the morning, but you can talk about more than that, can't you? You can talk about the darkness of this life and the darkness of, of grief and sorrow. And you can talk about the one who comes and raises us up. And then when you speak about the third thing, which was heart is steady and not afraid, you can speak of the one who comes to us and says, fear not. And so there's, 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 there's things you can work with here. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not turning on this particular method. Um, but if we're not careful, it become, can become little more than a lesson in morality. And so I, wa I want to go back and say, what is it that we want to say? Let's affirm that. And I think it's a good idea for all of us, somewhere in a drawer in our study in a file, to have a sermon that we simply preach at death. And, and so that if I get a call and somebody says, a friend says to me, look, I, I have a funeral, but I'm sick today and it's in half an hour, can you get over to the funeral home? That we can pull this out, and we know what it is we want to say no matter what. And then, hopefully, we can have ten minutes with the family before the service and, and find out enough to, to make it personal. And we don't want to use that sermon very often, maybe never at all. But it's a good thing to know what it is we want to say. Otherwise, we're going to end up preaching people into heaven and, and works righteousness. We want to, first of all, acknowledge death. So in this sermon that I have in my drawer, I say, today is a day to say goodbye. We've gathered to say goodbye to this person. And this goodbye is different than any goodbye you've ever said before. And maybe every day you say goodbye to them. Maybe they phone you. Maybe, and in the time you speak with the family, you can find out some of the ways they've communicated. And so I acknowledge that it's a time to say goodbye, but that this goodbye is different and harder than any other goodbye because of the finality of death, because of our own mortality in the sense that when we're saying goodbye to someone, it's sometimes bouncing back off the wall at us, reminding us that we're mortal and we don't want to get too close to this. And also we come, and there's unfinished business oftentimes because we didn't know this person was going to go, especially if it's a sudden passing, or there's something we just wish we could say one more time to this person, and we haven't had a chance to say that. And so what I, what I say in this, in this sermon that I know I always can preach to death is, okay, let's, let's stop and let's take some time in the quiet and say goodbye in our own way, and all of those other things we have to say. And hopefully, if you get those 10, 15, 20 minutes with the family, you can find some of the things that you can fit in that, you're, that you're, they're going to miss, that are going to be hard to say goodbye to about the person. And then give some silence. And let them in their hearts offer that up. And then, to break the silence by saying goodbye is not the last word today. Death does not get the final say. Period. And so today is also a day to offer this person up. And as we do, we offer them with thanksgiving. And we can talk about some of the good things about the person that we're so grateful for. And perhaps 
we'll talk about some memories and, and the power of memory and the importance of memory and to keep on telling the stories. But then also that it's an offering of faith. And always as a minister, I offer the person up in the name of Jesus Christ who's conquered the grave and death. And that's the name that's above every name and that I offer the person up to. In whose name I offer the person up. So that's, that's a way. That's just what I want to say is I want to acknowledge death. I want to acknowledge its reality and its effect on the human family. But then I want to lift up the name of Christ and proclaim the resurrection and say death doesn't have the last word. There's another word. And we can, and we can go on in faith. We can offer this person and embrace life again. So that's what we don't want to lose. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to say that same thing over and over. It's no different than, than preaching the Dorcas sermon to all of the women in the Dorcas group of the church. We've got to find a, a way to shape it. But that's, that's what we want to say. And we want to make it more and more personal. That's the call. That's what I think we need to do. Now, there's another very effective sermon that I found, not in the minister's manual, but from a friend, um, as I was collecting these sermons, it's one of the better sermons, I would say, that I found. And it was, it was preached by my good friend, who's here, Andrew Sturley, uh, who's a neighbor of mine in Toronto. And he preached it after a woman had died in his church of cancer. And the method that he used in his sermon was one of making multiple connections with the scripture. He wasn't going and latching onto this story of Esau and then getting lost telling it. He was finding different things and he had the advantage of knowing the person and having been with the person during her time of illness and during her, her dying. And, and so he came as a pastor who'd been with the person. That's of course a great, not something we always have the opportunity to, to, to proclaim, but that says a great deal. And so he's, from her story, he was able to say this. He, was said, he started off by saying, how do we get from the bad news to the good news? And he referred to a conversation he had with a friend who's a minister who lost a son, who said that his challenge in life was always getting from the bad news to the good news because the good news of death and dying often could be so overwhelming that it would come in waves. And then... Andrew spoke about his own conversation with this woman about that. And so out of that conversation came this, how do we get from the bad news to the good news? Embrace every day as a gift was one of the things. And Andrew said, could refer to the hospice where he had visited her or where she had been at one point, which was called every day as a gift. And so people knew that. And suddenly there's something in her story, something as simple as the name of a hospice that's, that's there being held up. And it parallels with Scripture. And so you can easily go from there to the Scripture about every day being a gift from God and how it was to her and how she in her illness was reminding all of us that it's a gift. And I think she had said something like that we're all terminal it's just that I'm more aware of the gift of every day. And so she was still speaking, and it was something very, very profound. How do we get from the bad news to the good news? Embrace every day as a gift. But more, acknowledge that every day is a challenge, that it's not all going to be easy, that there are difficulties. And again, he turned to his conversation with the deceased, and I think to a play that she had done. She was an actress about cancer, and it was just very well done. And then in the midst of that, he said, but in the challenges, we are not alone. And so he turned to the psalmist, 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they, they protect me. And so in the midst of the challenges, he, he embraced the presence and he invited the people to embrace the presence. And he took them to the scripture. You see, he's going from story to scripture to story to scripture to story to scripture. And it's very well done. And then he said his third point was, and he's a three-point preacher. Every day is preparation. And he quoted from a hymn, Unto the hills shall I lift up mine eyes. Now, you didn't tell me this, Andrew, 
but in our neighborhood where we serve, there are a number of private schools, and a, a number, whenever I see that someone's picked unto the hills, I have a sense that they probably went to Havergal College. I don't know. Did she go there? You see, so he picked that hymn, and to everyone who was in that congregation, who was from that school, knew that that was their hymn. And so it wasn't just picking a hymn that's ours, it was theirs. And so he went to it, and he found some of the treasures in that hymn. And he talked about the pilgrim psalmist. Every day is preparation. We're on a journey. We're going up to the promised land. We're going to Jerusalem. And in that hymn, he turned to the, to the line, God will preserve our going out and our coming in. And he claimed that promise. And then he ended like this. He reminded everyone that this woman had died on Easter Day. He said, I think that one of the fitting things that we need to take note of is the fact that she died on Easter Sunday. What a great day to die. It's the day of celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the promise of eternal life. But in a sense, every day is Easter Day. Every day is a reminder that God has gone and prepared the way for us through his Son. And so our lives lived here are not only to be lived in the fullness of time and the challenges and the opportunities that we have, but also in the assurance that there is eternal life to come. And that eternal life is a source of strength, of freedom, of comfort and courage right now. For we can live fully in the present if we both know that the future is in God's hands. And we have no need fear. And so, my friends, I pray that you will take with you some good news today. You've been with, I won't say the woman's name, through many of the pieces of bad news. But the good news is that her example teaches us to ensure that every day is a gift. That even if every day brings a new challenge, God is with us. And that always at the end, there is God who calls us by name and invites us to live with him forevermore. This is good news. Amen. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful sermon. Um, in, in the face of death, because what he's done, he, in, a, in, an, in a time and in a community where so many people are not only ignorant of the scriptures, but think that they're irrelevant, He's taken the authority of this person's life, the person they've gathered to honor, and he's used it to move, and he's been able to move from that story into Scripture, back into story, into Scripture, back into story, back into Scripture. Now, sometimes when people do that, they don't make it to where Andrew made it. It's not just getting from story to Scripture, from story to Scripture. The, the written word is to bear witness to the living word. And it's not just getting them to the Bible so that they can think the Bible's relevant. It's getting them to the promise and to the hope of the resurrection. And that's what Andrew did so well and so effectively. He not only got them to the written word, he got them to the living word and to an encounter with the promises of Christ and the good news of his resurrection. So a question that comes up, and, it, and we got onto it a bit last night, can we get to the good news without the bad news? And that came up in question period especially when we think of someone who's lived a long life and they're ready to go. I spoke about one grandmother last night. My other grandmother um, had diabetes in the end. She lost both of her legs. She was a woman of faith. I would visit her and she would say, Peter, why, why isn't the Lord calling me home? She was ready to go. Her bags were packed, if you will. It was still... When she went, so we had this sense of release and this sense of celebration that she'd gone home. But the rest of us were still left without her. And she had lived with our family. She was like a second mother. And so there was still a need to acknowledge the loss that I had of this woman, even though I knew she was ready to go. And I knew in faith that Christ was there to take her home. Can we get to the good news without the bad news. We shouldn't assume that just because someone's at that kind of place in their life, that it's necessarily easy for everyone else, even in the case of Alzheimer's. And uh, we, we got to this a little bit last night, but I had a, a service 
where there were three siblings. Their mother had died. I'd buried her a few years before. And the father, since that point, had had Alzheimer's. And they had cared for him. He had been in a home. And I thought it would be a very easy move. He was a man of faith. A very easy move from death to life and to the hope of new life. But what I found was that these three siblings were absolutely distraught. Now, usually we talk about preparatory grief, and people are able to oftentimes take care of some of their grief before in situations like this. But there were other realities at play that I was totally unaware of, and some I should have been. This was the last of the generation that had gone on before. These were three people who kept themselves looking very young. And now all of a sudden, they were the elders of the family. There was a passing of the torch. The death of the father meant that now they were the oldest. They tried, and, and were, they were very youthful looking. I also discovered that there were some differences between them. That as long as the father was alive never had to be talked about. What was going to happen to the cottage? And all of a sudden, as soon as that happened, these things had to be dealt with, and there was incredible tension um, in the air. And we need to be sensitive to these sorts of things. It's, it's never a picnic, is what I want to say. It's very difficult to, to think that we can get to the good news of Christ's resurrection without acknowledging the bad news of death. Because always, almost always, in some ways, there's something. But having said that, there was another sermon that I found preached by a woman um, who is a minister in Ontario. And I thought it was particularly effective. And it was a very similar situation where someone really had been at that end of the life where they were ready to go and they were released. And it, I, I call this for myself, I call it the Alpha and the Omega approach. And what she did was she began not with death, but she began with thanksgiving. We've, got, we've gathered to offer thanks for this life. And then she acknowledged the fact that there, were, there was grief in the family someone was gone, a mother who had carried them since their infancy. But then she moved. I called Alpha and Omega because she began with thanksgiving. And then she moved to faith and to the proclamation of the good news of Christ's resurrection and the God who welcomes us home to new life. And I think that's probably the most effective way to do it. If you want to be... We can't diminish death. But in, in the cases where there is a, a great sense of release, we can, we can go from, from thanksgiving and then acknowledge the grief and then resurrection and celebration. Can we get to the gospel without the scripture? Now, Andrew's beautiful sermon went from story to scripture to story to scripture. Can we get to the gospel without going to the scripture? Remembering that a funeral crowd is a very different crowd in the Sunday crowd. The Bible is, as ministers, I said on Monday, we are ministers of the Word. And our authority is the Word. And we're there to proclaim the Word. So we need to be very careful. And as I said, we always need to read the Word. And we can't assume that it speaks for itself, although it does by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the 19th century, they always started with the scripture. And often their sermons were peppered with scripture. But they didn't always get to the good news. In fact, they often didn't get to the good news. One of the reasons was because, you remember on Monday, if you were here, I, I talked about the sermon at one of the president's deaths, President Harrison. And I said, I haven't come to speak about this person to lift up their characters. I've come to be an ambassador, to speak from a higher authority. Sometimes they, they went so high in their authority that, that it became a morality lesson, the sermon did. 
And so there were sermons, lessons from life's brevity. And that was a very common kind of a theme. Teach us to number our days. And, and that would be it for an hour and a half, elaborating on these texts, throwing in all kinds of other texts, oftentimes. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't other elements in the service that proclaimed the resurrection, but oftentimes in those sermons, so that you can get to the scripture again and again and again without necessarily getting to the good news. And the ultimate, the, the end that we want to get to is to the good news. I, I say to you that oftentimes I, th- I find myself f- not able to relate to that 19th century preacher. I'm not living in the same world. I find myself in Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens and he's preaching in the marketplace and they say, come up and speak to the council. on the Areopagus, Mars Hill. Come and speak to us. You remember what Paul did? Now, Paul was as well-versed in the Hebrew Scriptures as anyone. He could have argued anything from those Scriptures. He knew them so well. He wandered around the area. He scoured the ground in search of something, something in which he could, with which he could engage them. And so he found an altar to, the un- to an unknown God. And he began with that. An altar to an unknown God. He said, the God that's unknown to you I've come to proclaim. I feel like that's where I am oftentimes when I'm called to do a service. That I'm there. Those people don't know the scriptures just as they didn't know them in Greece. And when we are there in such a way, speaking, we're speaking their language. We're being incarnational in our ministry. When we can go and scour the earth around and find the one thing in their life which enables us to elevate the conversation and speak to them of higher things. And Paul, whether it was in the marketplace or whether it was there with the, the council always ended with the resurrection. Just read his sermons. Read the sermons of Acts. Always coming to the resurrection. Now, when, when I feel this, I'm also influenced in a very profound way by something that, that I read when I was uh, a teenager because it was a missionary from the church that I, that I went to that I was raised in, in, in British Columbia, my father's church. And he, he went off to Irian Jaya, and some of you may be familiar with his book. The, he went into a tribe, and he was the first person from Western civilization they'd ever seen. And he went in and translated their language. His wife was a nurse. He was a missionary. And so when he learned their language, he translated the New Testament, the Gospels. And when he finished the Gospel... He sat down, he sat them all down. They had, they had great respect for him because, you know, he was living with them, he was learning from them. And he read to them the stories of Jesus. And they liked Jesus. And I don't know if you know this story or not. He got to the story of Judas betraying Jesus. And they all clapped and cheered. Because for them, the highest virtue was was what they called fattening someone for the slaughter, fattening them with friendship for the slaughter. Judas had done it. He he was absolutely distraught. And then uh, there was a a battle, a war, between this tribe he was working with and a a rival tribe. And people were being killed, and his wife was trying to, to, to to give them medical attention. He had children in the midst of this battle, And and he went to them and said, there has to be peace or I have to leave. And so they went through this process of peace. And and the process was that one of the elders of one community gave his newborn son to the leader of the other tribe. And as long as that child was alive, there was a peace. Eureka. You know what he did. He, he recast the story. He said, God 
Jesus that I've been telling you about is God's peace child. And, and God gave him to us to make peace, and he is alive. And suddenly Judas was the anti-hero, because no one could ever harm a peace child. And, and the resurrection, you see, meant that the peace with God was eternal. And suddenly these people just embraced the gospel. And he wrote a book about it. And, he, and he's helped all kinds of other missionaries decipher stories and cultures, believing that within the stories of cultures, there are redemptive analogies, as he calls them. Now, I don't know if there are in every story or not. But I, I believe that when we go into the, into the life of the deceased, we, we go in the same way to listen for stories or hints of redemption, of the presence of God, of the gifts of God, of the grace of God. For I believe that God is everywhere. God is everywhere. He goes into the places, just as Jesus did, the places that we would not go into. We talk about these people that we're called on to bury from time to time. Jesus was usually criticized for spending time with these same people. And, and so I want to encourage you to be open to those kind of stories, analogies, metaphors that, that can enable us, that, that can become instruments of hope and resurrection. Just a word about, about hope and imagination and metaphor. We are to be, I believe, instruments of hope. That would be to be pointing people to the hope of the resurrection. One of the great instruments of hope is imagination. Hope imagines and it refuses to stop imagining or hypothesizing. It's always imagining what is not yet seen or a way out of a difficulty or a wider perspective for life or thought. We're always to be imagining with our people because we believe that there is a way out. It's been shown to us. And so we go into their life and, and we imagine we let our imagination speak to us and become instruments. We need to, to be guarded, too, because faith and hope may be imaginative acts. But everything, everywhere that our imagination leads us is not necessarily redemptive or hopeful or helpful. Our imagination can lead us all in all kinds of crazy places as well. We know that. And so always we need to be checking our imagination against the Word, against the Scripture, so that it's a sanctified imagination and offering it to God. Metaphor. Metaphor lifts us out of the specific place and time that we're trapped in and opens us to the presence of the universal. Metaphor is, is a symbol that Somehow, all of a sudden, when we think we're way down there, it, 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 we're able to grab onto it and it pulls us up. It's a magnificent thing. Now, metaphor can be an instrument of resurrection because resurrection lifts us up. But resurrection, and this is very important, resurrection is not metaphor. Resurrection is reality. We need not make that mistake. We must not make that mistake. But when in our imaginations we turn to metaphor, we turn to them as instruments of hope that people can use to, to, to be caught up somehow towards the resurrection. Now, I don't, I don't know if any of you are baseball fans. A few years ago, there was a, there was a special on PBS by Ken Burns called Baseball. And, and in his special, he interviewed Rachel Robinson, the widow of Jackie Robinson, the first African-American player in the major leagues. And she spoke about his funeral, Jackie's funeral, when he died. He died quite young. Jesse Jackson had conducted the funeral. I've read his sermon. Somewhere buried in the midst of it is a phrase 
And Rachel Robinson, it's the only thing she remembers. Well, she didn't say that, but she, she said, as soon as I heard that, I knew that Jackie was okay. Here's what Jesse Jackson said. She said, or here's what Rachel said. She said, when Jesse said, Jackie stole home, I knew he was safe. He said, in his last dash, Jackie stole home. Pain, misery, and travail have lost. Jackie is saved. And when he said, Jackie stole home, I knew he was safe. Now, on one level, people are going to think, well, Jackie was the base-stealing king. And whenever he was on third base, he was a threat to steal home. And when he stole home, he was usually safe. But there's more. Some of these metaphors are very deep and profound. And if you're from the African-American community, you know the song. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away to Jesus. And so the metaphor, you see, you see, just that simple thing that he offered in the midst of that service, suddenly she grasps onto it. And even if he didn't say all the stuff about steal away home, she goes home and she's clinging on to this thing. And she's singing, steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. And she's filled with a peace. I encourage you to think of metaphor and story redemptively and to hold it up in the funeral. I sometimes don't even remember what they were, but I had a funeral one day for a woman. Seven years earlier, I buried her husband, and one of the grandchildren came to me and said, I still remember what you said about the clouds at Grandpa's funeral. I'd given them a metaphor, and it was still clinging to that metaphor, and it was something out of the grandfather's life. I had another funeral a number of years ago for a, for a man, a grandfather, a father and grandfather. And as I sat and listened to the man's story, they talked a lot about the cottage they went to and spent the summer at. And I said, was he there? Was he at the cottage all summer with you? They said, no, no, he was working in the city. And I said, did he ever get up? Every Friday night he came up. He'd finish work, he'd come up. He'd get there usually pretty late, they said. Usually you'd get to the marina after everything was closed. And our cottage was around the point from the marina. We couldn't see him. But he had this signal. He honked his horn three times. And then we'd go out in the boat around the point and bring him home. That's what they told me as I was getting ready. I said to them, well, you know what I said to them. I said, Dad's honked the horn three times. And there's one who comes to us through all of the storms of life. We can't see him around the corner. But he knows us. And he's come. And he's taken him home. And it's eight years later, I saw one of the grandchildren. And they said to me, you know, I still, whenever... I think of parking at the marina. I think of that story about Grandpa and about going home. Find something in the story. Find a metaphor, something to lift up. Jeremy Begley writes this, We are carried away by metaphor. It takes us into its life. We are embodied in the metaphor. We surrender ourselves to it. He's right. So... I encourage you to turn to metaphor, to story, to imagination in the service of the one who truly embodies us and takes us into his life, Jesus Christ, that we might lift them up to the one who has been lifted up on high. It's an instrument of resurrection. It takes them closer to the promises of Jesus. It's not a metaphor that we're after, though. It's the signs of God's presence. 
a sign in some way that God is here. And so I encourage you, when you're called on to, to visit a family, it's what I, I call the exegesis of the deceased. It's a good idea to do an exegesis of yourself, to know what's going on inside of you, because we don't want ourselves to get in the way. But the exegesis of the deceased, the exegesis, too, of the bereaved. When you're called, go. If you can, go. It's not always possible to go to the home of the deceased. Sometimes it's, there's no access to it. But if it's at all possible, and especially if you've never been there, go to the home of the deceased if you can. Now, there's also reason to meet in your study. It's, there are fewer distractions. Sometimes if you go to the home of the bereaved, the phone's ringing, someone's at the door, and there's all kinds of distractions. But if it's at all possible, go to the home of the deceased. And, and think of it like CSI. Go in there looking for the fingerprints of God. Because God's there. Listen radically to the story. Now, I, I, there's all kinds of questions, and, and I have a, a list of questions that I call the exegesis of the deceased. But I don't need to go through those with you because I'm sure that you have a good sense of what those are. But, but just go in and begin the story. And don't be afraid to ask questions. You might go and you might see some pictures. And that's a good place to start. Let's talk about these pictures. Or if you haven't seen, if you've never met this person, can I see a picture of them? And then they'll bring out a picture. And then someone will bring out another picture. And, an, and they'll start telling stories. And I don't know which story is going to be. You might have to listen to 15 stories that are nothing. But you'll get a sense of the person. But then maybe if, it, when you're listening, and this is what I find works for me, there's just something, and all of a sudden, it just jumps off the page. Listen radically. And when you do, it's a, it's a wonderful therapy for the people. Because it, it enables them to talk, but it also comforts them to know that you care that much about the person. Listen for, for the metaphor. Maybe it's a hobby they had. Talk, ask them. If there's nothing, ask them about their hobbies. Ask them if they traveled. Where did they go? And something might come up. They might pull something out. That becomes, there might be something there on a shelf that's maybe a symbol of something. What, what, is, what is this? Don't be afraid to ask. They want to talk to you. They need to talk to you. Listen radically, believing that in the midst of it, Christ is there. God is everywhere. Listen radically. Now, just as an example, I'm going to give you a few examples. A woman that I visited in the hospital was the world water skiing champion when she was young. And I knew her, and I'd visited her. She'd been suffering from cancer for some time. I went to see her in the hospital. She said, where did you go for your holiday? Because I'd been away for a week or two. I said, we were in Florida. Where did you go? I said, well, we went here, we went there. And one of the places that we'd taken the children was Cypress Gardens. Well, that's where she trained when she was young. And so she wants to know all about it. Well, the story, my story at Cypress Gardens w was this, that we saw these incredible water skiers in that place. But right in the middle of the show, there was a thunderstorm. And everyone went running away, frightened to death. And no one was there to, f to sort of finish the show. Well, there you go. I had a sense, I have a sense, I said to everyone, that that we're there at that show and this terrible storm has come in. And we're not able to finish it and we're not able to, to express our appreciation. We haven't been able to. And she hasn't been able to finish. Something else she told me in all of that conversation was that she and her husband had a boat and they would boat on Lake Ontario and one time they went out in a storm and she's never gone out since. So I could talk about to her then in the hospital and to the people about my conversation with her, just as Andrew did, about the one who comes to us in the storm. Comes to us in the storm of death, takes our death upon himself, and comes to us and guides us safely to the other side.
just, that's just one example. There, there was a, a woman, an elderly couple I visited. They lived on a street near my church. They'd been living in this house since they were married, 60 some odd years. Before that, he had lived there. And everyone knew this was their house. And so in, in my, the house became the metaphor, if you will. I used the home as a metaphor to speak about the woman who had died. I started on the front porch and told the people how she'd once told me that during the war years, when her husband was in Europe serving in the Air Force, she would sit on the front porch, and every time she saw a boy on a bicycle turn the corner from Young Street up their street, that her heart would sink, fearing that the messenger boy with bad, had bad news about her husband from the front. I then went inside the house as I spoke to the people. I took them on a tour of the house, and each room stopped to admire something that spoke of this woman's character like the antique dining room suite, which she had refinished. We went to the room where she had cared for her ailing parents in their final years. We admired the paintings of A.J. Casson, one of the group of seven artists, which were given to them because his mother rented a room from them. And we talked about that. And towards the end, we went upstairs to the upper room where her husband had cared tenderly for her in her illness, where I had visited with them, where I had taken to them communion and shared in some very sacred moments with them an upper room that spoke to us of another upper room and of one who comes to us and takes our suffering upon himself and offers us new life. And then I took them back to the front porch I told them about the day a, a bicycle turned on Young Street, up their street, and the boy stopped in front of her house to say that her husband was coming home. And I talked about now. We're on the porch, and the word has come. She's home. And she's home because of this one who comes to us in our grief and in our sorrow, in all the days of our lives. He carries us with him. I had a woman, I, I, I went to visit a family. I got to the front door of the house. It was the biggest front door I've ever seen in my life. It, 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 I don't know, it was huge. And I stood there and looked at this door. We talked about the door. I went in, we talked about the woman who had died. I came to learn very quickly that she was an open door. She was a caring person who was so hospitable towards others, and so I spoke about her door and about her being an open door. In the midst of it, I talked about the loss and the grief, but I also talked about the one who says, I am the door, and how he stands at the door and knocks, and how he's there for us to, to open the door to eternal life. You can go on and on. I think that I've I'm, I'm not going to... I'm going to have to cut this out. Though. Just one more. I went and, s and met with a family. I had buried the, fo the elderly father and grandfather six months before. Now the mother died, very unexpectedly. She died at her cottage. I met with the family in the city. I knew the woman. These people went to my church. I didn't know her all that well but I had been with her when her husband had died, and I had been in touch with her since that time, and I knew her family. So I sat with them, and I said, let's go over her story. So they're pulling out this and that, and this and that, and this and that, and somewhere somebody says, oh yeah, and way back when, she, she um, rescued a bunch of girls on a lake in, uh, in, Mani in, in Saskatchewan uh, when there was a storm one time, and uh, I said, what's that all about? And they said, well, she never talked about it. And then one of them said, but there's a newspaper clipping somewhere about it. I said, there is? Can I see that? And so, lo and behold, somebody, the daughter went and dug this thing up and, and got it to me. And so, I took it home with me. And these are, I go home and, and I 
I, I go into, sometimes I have to say, I go into a sort of a trance when I'm doing this. I'm going over this thing, and I'm thinking, here's a story. It was a Sunday afternoon. They were in a rowboat on a lake in Saskatchewan. I didn't know there were lakes in Saskatchewan. They were on a lake in, I'm just kidding. They were on a lake in Saskatchewan in a rowboat on a Sunday afternoon. A storm came up out of the middle of nowhere. This was about 90 years ago, maybe more. People didn't know how to swim like they do now. And this boat capsized. There were six girls. And she was the only one who knew how to swim. And she got all the girls to cling onto the boat. And she swam more than a mile through the storm to the shore. And God help, flagged down someone, God help. And they got back out there just in time to save these girls. Well, I've probably told too many about storms already, but... You, you can see where I'm going on this. Right? You, you see, it's, it's not that hard. If you listen to these stories. And so I'm, I'm there in my study, and I'm pouring over this thing, and I'm going, you know, um, I, I was starting to write something about probably every year on this day, there are six girls, because they were all younger than she was, six girls who stop and thank God for this woman. And I started to write the day, and my goodness, it was the same day. It was the same hour all these years. I said, now if one of those women was thanking God this year for her rescue, and maybe saying a prayer for your mother. She was praying for her at the very hour that the one who comes to us in the storm, as she had come to them. Unbelievable. The family. The daughter went back up to the cottage after the service the next week. She said, Mom never talked about that. She went to her mother's bedroom, and on the night table beside the bed, there was a photograph that the daughter had never seen. What do you think it was a photograph of? It was a photograph of the lake, where all those years before, there was sometimes you just have this sense when, when you really immerse yourself in someone's story and look for the presence of God, you have a deep sense that you're in holy ground. And you just have to take off your shoes and seek with every ounce that you have to be faithful to the message that's been entrusted to us in season and out. The good news of Christ's resurrection. And I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to go into those situations believing that you're on holy ground, listening for the sense of the sacred, being alert both to the need to grieve and to the good news of Christ's resurrection, and seeking to find that little thing that will enable you to help those who come who may be hostile to the word, but wanting to honor the person's story. Help them get from a way down here to a way up there. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. We do have some time uh, for questions this evening, but uh, you, some of you um, may have been hearing a thumping that's been going on up here, and it reminds me of the scripture text that says the place where they were meeting were shake, was shaken. Um, I'm been, I've been told that it's some snow that's just been coming off the roof, and um, there's some wind out there with some rain, and so all is well, in case you've been wondering. Now, we'll take some time for some questions. And um, I'm going to do my best uh, to see you.
Who has a question that would like to begin this evening? Thank you. Come along. Thank you very much. This has been really helpful. Um, I find when I'm meeting with the family before a funeral that it's a great occasion to learn what some of the folk theologies that people have mm -hmm. would be, both within the church and without the church. You know, within it's maybe a syncretism of gospel and uh, self-help of some kind, and without, of course, it could be any number of hopes. Mm -hmm. And at the funeral, and of course in conversation personally with people, um, I want to be able to offer a real hope rather than a false hope. But I also don't find that the funeral sermon is a great time for dismantling or deconstructing people's folk theology and you know doing a point by point refutation of what they think. And then, so you understand the, the question, how do you uh, deal um, respectfully with the diversity of opinion which is maybe even more pronounced in a funeral congregation than a typical Sunday one, uh, but at the same time move people towards hope in the resurrection of Christ? Um, thank you. I, I, I think you, you've sort of answered it yourself. I, I don't think it's the time to try to dismantle um, the folk theology. It's a time to do whatever you can to lift up the risen Christ before them. Um, and that's the hope that we have, that we share, and that we, we, need, we need to proclaim um, without being ashamed, as Paul said to Timothy. You know, this is our gospel. Or the, this is the gospel, and this is what we've got to proclaim the resurrection. Um, that's... That's what I, I, I would say to you. Don't, don't, you don't need to worry about all that other stuff, I don't think. Um, that stuff will take care of itself. I don't know if that's helpful, but in, unless, you're, unless you're dealing with something really specific, it's hard to say you know, a, a lot more than that. So, um, Thank you. Thank you. Now, I should have mentioned there is a microphone there and one here. So if the microphones are open, and we will wait if you have a question. And and if not, we'll begin to move the evening toward a conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Holmes, for your message tonight and your pointers. I've, uh, by the grace of God, stumbled into a similar method in many respects to what you've been do doing. And I came up come across a situation uh, last fall I should probably identify myself as well. The Reverend Bruce Alcorn, Calvary Baptist Church, Black Harbor, Beaver Harbor, Baptist as well in, in New Brunswick on the Fundy Shore. On November 13th, it was a Tuesday, pot setting day in that part of the of Bay of Fundy, the Stickley Zone we were in. We lost one of our fishermen at sea in a very tragic accident. Those in New Brunswick, of course, are probably familiar with the story. A man named uh, Clifford Naughty. And uh, in, the, uh, in the whole event that took place, Mr. Nodding gave his life uh, for the three crewmen that uh, hmm. were on the boat with him. And of course, in the mercy of God, I was able to make the connection with the gospel for the sermon. So in the sermon at the funeral, of course, and I, I read scriptures in the funeral as well, like you know, good use of the scriptures in the funeral service. I made the point uh, that uh, just as Mr. Nodding gave his life for the three men, and, and on the boat with him so they could survive. So Christ substituted for us and gave his life for us. And, and that's, the, uh, that's similar to what I think you've been saying. Yeah, tonight. that's, that's, that's and uh, it was just I just thank God for it. it was, and I had a huge crowd. And the church wasn't just full, it was overflowing. Right. Calvary Baptist Church will seat 280 some comfortably, 300 some overflowing standing room. And there was, they say, between four or 500 people. And you count the people standing the stairs outside the front lawn and that kind of thing. Some couldn't even hear the service. I mean, it was, but well, most people did. Uh, so that was an opportunity for the gospel to be able to talk about the, the Lord's death and, uh, and, and how, that, how that applied. And that's, that's uh, and it's something I just wanted to share with you. And, uh, that's beautiful. That's a question, but it, it can work. And we can bring the gospel into it. I mean, keep the gospel connected to these situations. And I've learned it along the way. My wife helped me uh, many years ago about that in funerals and things like that to to connect with something out of the person's life, like you mentioned tonight. 
that's the most obvious situation I've dealt with. <laughs> that was a pretty obvious fit. In some cases, like you say, it's hard to, to get to the, to the connection. But thank you very much. Well, well done. This, uh, this, even having made the connection, it must have been a very exhausting experience for you. So well done. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I too have appreciated uh, this week's lectures and, and talkbacks and so on. Um, I'm just one of the things I struggle with is how to help people make the that connection with the reality of death. And I look at you know what we see on the TV and uh, from some Middle Eastern countries when somebody dies, whether it's you know in, in a bombing or whatever. Uh, you know, they pick up the body and there's this big processional and the body gets passed from person to person and paraded through the streets and it's a very hands-on, you know, uh, kind of experience, which I'm not saying we need to do that, but in, but in our setting, everything uh, seems to be, have become more sterile and white glove and, and everything is done, you know, very prim and proper in the folding of the, of the you know, the, the casket stuff when the, it's all closed and it's, and it's almost like, um, well, it, the, the reality of the death has become sort of removed somewhat from the people. Like it's not, um, well, it's, like it's it, in a sense like a pretending like this is... Uh, yeah, it's sterility. I don't know, sterility in a sense, yeah. yeah. And, and, and everybody says, oh, doesn't this person look so good, mm. you know? Uh, because, you know, we're taught how to use the waxes and the makeups and whatever yeah, to make yeah. the person look as though they're just sleeping. And, and I'm thinking, I don't know, I just don't quite get that, you know? Like, like to me, there's something a bit healthier about parading the body through the streets or, you know, like something that, that, it, that it somehow acknowledges the fact that this person has died, you know, got, grown old and died. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm just kind of, that's part of my struggle. I don't know whether, uh, you know, that's, that's a something that you face in, in terms of how the funeral directors do things at your place, but to me, uh, the family is kind of removed and from, uh, you know, from the contact, if you will, from this dead body, you know. Yeah. I, I grew up, I guess what I, when, you know, part of my experience growing up was our uh, family tradition was the wake was in the home. Right. And the body was downstairs in the living room, you know, for a couple of days. Yeah. Which is a whole different different way of looking at things. It's very different. Yeah. So uh, I I, th I think that the, the way that I would encourage you to do it because I don't think we're going to change the fact that traditions are eroding um, w would be to get into the story of the relationships and find out how what what. What were the things that are suddenly are really going to be missed about this person? And talk about those things. Name them. Um, and sometimes they're very simple. Uh, you know, I mentioned yesterday, I think, that I had a woman uh, and her daughter died. And I did her funeral a few weeks ago. Um, every day the daughter phoned the mother at 4.30. And I said, this goodbye is different. I said, you know, it's so final. It's it. I said... The, you, you know, the phone's going to ring at 4.30, you think, there she is, and it's going to be somebody else, or it's not going to ring. Mm -hmm. um, and, and suddenly you're, you're enabling people to see, um, the, and they know it anyways, that there's a brokenness, that things aren't the same now. Um, so so that's, that's, I think, the gentle way to do it is to, f to find out how it, how it's going to touch their stories, and that you come you come to that from sitting down and talking with them, mm -hmm. and as, as they uh, sort of unfold who this person was, and maybe you already know anyways. Certainly, when it's a person in the church or someone you know well, um, you know for yourself what what difference is going to make in your life, and you can always speak to that when you know the person, you know what it is that's going to be different now mm -hmm. that they're gone. Um, I talked about the the friend, the former chair of deacons uh, this morning. I talked about him who died. It's very hard when you, someone you love like that is gone. And, and I said, you know, one of the things I said was, I was talking, I won't go into the whole thing I did with the metaphor, but, but I said, you know, he always, he always had a way, of, and this was true, whenever there was someone that we had a particular problem and, and it was going to be a difficult conversation that we had to deal with someone, um, 
he would always volunteer, and he just had a wonderful way of having a conversation with someone about bad news. And I, and I acknowledge this. I said he always had a way of making bad news good. He just knew what to, he knew what just what to say. And I said, do I ever wish I could hear his voice right now, telling me what to say? But right now, I miss his voice. Um, so th- that's that would be my answer. That's that's the um, the reality that we want to speak into. Because I don't think we're going to change, um, in the short term anyways, the erosion of traditions. Um, when, when, the Christian, when, when the Christian church was being established, we, we know from the New Testament scriptures that people would high, hire mourners and people would come and they would shout. And, and there, it, was, it was a very dark time, a uh, time of grief and bereavement. And there were these processionals um, through the streets, um, and, and the mourners would go and weep and wail, and they would dress in black. The Christians, the early Christians, changed everything. They did it differently. They dressed the person in white, the color of baptism, as a sign that as they had been brought to new life in their baptism, so too they were being brought to new life through the one who raised us up to new life. They walked through the streets, they had processions, but they sang hymns and hallelujahs. And when they buried the people, they always buried them facing the east, at least in the west, facing the new Jerusalem, and the, but, but also facing the rising of the sun. Because they believed, and they would proclaim the sun of righteousness, the coming of the resurrection. So there was, and and so that's why when Paul writes, as someone quoted this morning, we grieve not as those who have no hope. We want to name death and acknowledge the place of grief and give people permission to their feelings. But in the end, we always want to bury them facing the east and the rising sun and proclaim the Son of Righteousness. And that in the end, we celebrate better than anyone else because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. That is a wonderful note for us to end this evening on. I want to thank you, and I've been asking some people if they had one word to describe uh, in their life um, what it has meant for you to be here, and also some of the things you've said to them, to all of us. These are a few of the words. Challenging. Helpful. I think for a pastoral leader coming among us, the word helpful is probably a wonderful word. Engaging. Inspiring. And real. And I think that captures something of the sentiment of our people here. And so we want to thank you, Peter, very much for being with us. Please express your thanks again.